guest today is New York Times best-selling author Irene Spencer. Irene, it is so delightful to have you here today. Well, thank you. I realize that the books that you wrote were based on your real personal life story inside a polygamist cult. That's true. Inside of that cult, I understand that there was something equivalent to the Muslims' honor killings going on as a basic tenant of the religion. That something was called blood atonement. Will you tell us when you first heard about that? Well, most people think that blood atonement referred to the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made. But in Mormonism, blood atonement means that you have to pay your own life by giving your blood, by having your throat cut or your blood spilled upon the ground that it might ascend unto God, that he might forgive you. Now when you talk about Mormonism, you're talking about fundamentalist Mormonism specifically, are you not? Uh, yes, I am, but the uh, fundamentalists got their doctrine from the uh, Journal of Discourses from Brigham Young and the early uh, Mormon leaders. Can you tell us when you first heard about blood atonement as a child? Did you read about it later in a book as you grew up? When did you first hear about it? How did it apply to your life? I heard about it from the time I was a, a young child. Uh, we were t told that we there were certain sins that we could commit that only our blood could uh, pay for. And it was really frightening because I remember as a child I used to worry they would read to us out of uh, the Journal of Discourses and the Sermons of Brigham Young where he said that uh, uh, you could even be put to death for lying and for stealing, for adultery. Uh, and I just, it, it was horrifying because you used to think, well, if I stole anything or did anything and they found out that I'd be put to death. So as a child, you were taught that if you disobeyed certain rules, that to kill you was okay as part of the religion, to save your soul, of course, right? Well, absolutely. In fact, uh, Brigham Young said that if people knew that they had committed certain sins, that they would actually go to the brethren and beg of them to slit their throats and kill them, that they might be saved. And Brigham Young said that I have as much uh, right to kill you as I do to baptize you. And so, uh, and they say, we're just doing it for, to save you. You know, we're doing you a favor, in other words. Irene, in all of these cults, like Warren Jeffs and all of the rest of them, had their own writings that they claimed were directly from God. So these journal of discourses that you were raised on, how do you know where they really came from? Well, the church actually had them put out. Everybody in the church, in the early church, owned them. My grandparents and, and my great grandparents, uh, it was just the thing that they read, and they read them to us on Sundays, and, and we were, so that we would know what went on in the church. Most people say, oh, these are anti-Mormon things. People are talking against the, the Mormons, but no, it came from the Mormons. So the Journal of Discourses are a basic a whole volume of books. Like 26 volumes, I think. It has all the discourses of all the early presidents from Brigham Young on down at the time. And volume four, I understand, has a great number of the blood atonement statements in it from Brigham Young. Is that correct? Yes. So as a little girl, you grew up believing that if you did not live all the commandments told to you, that you could be, and should be possibly, killed to save your soul. Am I interpreting that right? Exactly, exactly. And was one of those commandments absolutely mandatory, plural marriage? Well, plural marriage, we were told that we would absolutely lose our uh, salvation. We would be damned uh, if we didn't. And so... We grew up not even considering not living polygamy. We were, I mean, we were going to get into it and help a man uh, become a god, and it was our responsibility to help him become a god by giving him other wives and uh, helping him live that principle. Isn't one of the conditions of blood atonement also to apostatize or turn away from the faith? Oh yes, uh, uh, Brigham Young said in the uh, Journal of Discourses that. Um, that the people that left it would be uh, put to death. He said that you're actually doing them a favor because they would be saved in the uh, hereafter, you know, in the afterlife if they gave their lives for it. 
In fact, uh, he said in one part, he said, the day will come when uh, we will say, are you for God? And if you're not for God, then your throat will be uh, cut and, and uh, you know, they'll get you coming and going one way or the other. <laughs> in other words, you were taught to believe that if you did not live plural marriage or if you turned away from the belief of plural marriage, your life was literally in danger. And that was a basic tenet of your faith? Well, it has always been the basic tenet of all of it, that, uh, of being destroyed, of being uh, put to death, of having a spiritual death, and, and, uh, but it was taken literal. I know one uh, of many uh, cults, because I grew up and our families intermarried into different ones and ones of them. They all talked of blood atonement. It wasn't some big secret. It was like it was uh, put out there to, as a form of control. You said your families intermarried into all of these cults. Would you name some of them that your family is intermarried into? Well, uh, I was more or less raised in the Apostolic Brethren, the one of uh, Rulon Allred. He was my mother's brother. I was raised in his. Then I joined the LeBaron group when I was 16 and moved to Mexico, and I became in that infamous cult, which was the uh, worst of any of the cults because it led to the fulfillment of blood atonement, as some other groups had done. They weren't the only ones. So you actually lived in Mexico in the cult where Herbal LeBaron ordered the execution of nearly 30 people. Is that right? Yes, I grew up uh, knowing Herbal, <laughs> seeing him almost every day. He was my brother-in-law. I saw how he started out uh, thirsting after power and after control and believe it or not he started reading the journals of discourses is where he got all his ideas from Ervo started reading them and just couldn't leave him alone and read all these places where people should be put to death and he saw that he could have power and control of people so he did he started his own church well later yeah he started his, uh, the church of the lamb of god and he uh, his brother joel had the Church of the Firstborn in the Fullness of Times. Uh, Ervil actually had Joel put to death, and then he started his own church and took a lot of Joel's followers and had them follow him. And he continued to have people murdered that he felt were a threat to him, didn't he? Oh yes, he had his own daughter, Rebecca. She was like 17 years old and she was pregnant at the time. He had her put to death. He had uh, two of his wives put to death. Uh, he had friends supposedly put to death. Uh, I was even on his death list, as was my husband Berlin, and uh, his, uh, my sister, his first wife, Charlotte. Uh, we lived in fear and were in hiding. Uh, it was an absolute reign of terror at that time. Talking about the other polygamous cults, all rose up after Ervil was captured and said, he isn't us, that has nothing to do with us, you can't paint polygamy with the same brush. Isn't it a fact that absolutely all of those same polygamous cults that claim or blame Mormonism teach blood atonement the way you have described it here from the Journal of Discourses as a basic tenet of their religion? Absolutely. Uh, Warren Jeffs, their group, uh, taught it. In fact, I don't know of a polygamous group that doesn't teach it. It's something that they have taught that uh, it's a, a tenet of our salvation. I mean, we're gonna, if we're going to have our salvation, uh, we need to have our throats cut. And even in Utah, they had, when they put people to death, uh, they said that they would rather not do it by hanging because they had to have their blood spilled and it was better to actually shoot them or to cut their throat. So, yes, it's a very real thing. So, blood atonement, to save your soul, is a basic tenet of fundamentalist polygamist Mormonism. Absolutely. My purpose is to tie in all of the polygamist cults that they do literally teach it if they claim or blame Mormonism. The aspect here involved is, isn't it fear that creates the glue that holds these polygamist cults together? Not faith, but fear. Is that true? Absolutely. It was in my case and every other case I ever saw. You feared 
that if you didn't do it, you would be destroyed. And even in the section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants, where it tells you that you have to live uh, polygamy. Cody Brown, star of Sister Wives' alleged reality show on TV, his wives claimed polygamy is their faith, what they believe in. So as a result of your telling me what you just told me, why are they really backing and supporting polygamy? I used to say it was my faith too, but it, I should have said it was my fear because you were afraid not to do it. You didn't do it because you loved the principal and because you wanted to get another wife in the family so you could feel jealous over her. It wasn't because you wanted all these things. It's that you feared that if you did not, that you would be destroyed. And the scriptures backed it up in the name of God saying that you would be destroyed. So uh, take your choice. Do you want to go, go to live polygamy or do you want to go to hell? So we entered into polygamy and found out we were in hell. If, if having multiple mates takes a man to the highest degree of glory, if a woman had several husbands, where does that take her when she had multiple mates? Well, multiple mates was never considered because it wasn't in the, uh, the men are the one that wrote all the rules and, and uh, the women had no say so about it. I was watching an excerpt on the web last night and I saw a man expounding about eternal principle of plural marriage saying that he had a wife that he loved very much and she had died and he had remarried and he found the great joy in polygamy that in eternity he was going to have both of those wives and there was another excerpt where said polygamy was really good because if a man had several wives then he didn't have to put himself upon a woman that was pregnant or nursing and had other things going on in her life. If a woman has more than one husband in her life and one of them dies, does she get all those husbands in eternity? No, they say that when you marry the first husband and you're sealed for time and all eternity, then you're going to be his and I don't care if you marry two or three times after that. They say that those children that you have by other marriages by another man will automatically belong to the first man that you were sealed to and those children will be his to help him uh, expand you know, his kingdom. Well, I understand that if a woman doesn't accept plural marriage and another wife is brought in and she's jealous or upset or has her feelings hurt, that she has to get over that and she has to conquer all of those feelings or she does not have the spirit of the Lord. Is that true? Oh, absolutely. In fact, uh, everybody put on this facade of happiness and, and being sweet and being kind. Well, even me, I uh, talked about and tried to convince other people that I was happy, yet I would go to bed at night and weep in my pillow of rages of jealousy. What woman isn't going to feel jealous when her husband's in the other room sleeping with an, uh, another woman? You know, it's just natural. And I was told, hey, you've got to overcome your jealousy, you must overcome this or you're going to lose your salvation. And I would weep and weep about it, but it did not take away my feelings. I felt like that I was uh, being uh, cursed. And how many wives did your husband have? He had nine others besides me. I was the second of his ten wives and he had 58 children, 29 daughters and 29 sons. In the areas of Tibet, they frequently live polyandry, which is that they have more than one husband. Women are rare there, so women have several husbands. So if a woman brings home another husband and sleeps with him and the first husband doesn't like it, I guess he just doesn't have the spirit of the Lord and he isn't sweet, right? <laughs> <laughs> Men would be enraged. You know, if I was in the other room sleeping with another man and my husband was waiting for his turn, you know, he would probably come in and kill us both and rant and rage and I mean he wouldn't put up with it but as women we're supposed to keep our mouth shut and do as we are told. That's the whole point. As a tenant of the religion if you did that you would be committing adultery and he would have a right to kill you as a tenant of the religion. Is that right? Absolutely. Even Brigham Young in the Journal of Discourse has said that he didn't have any wife that he loved too much that he wouldn't be willing to put a dagger through her and her lover's heart if he caught him in a uh, 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 the act of adultery. But if the woman doesn't accept it, she doesn't have the spirit of the Lord. No, absolutely not. 
how is it you have a God that only loves his sons? Well, from the beginning we were told that we were inferior, we were just women. We were the breeding stock that kept these movements expanding and alive. That's what we were born for, was to be mothers and to raise children. And uh, I don't care how tired you were, how sick you were during your pregnancies, I don't care if your life was threatened during, uh, uh, you know, because of some medical reason, you were to bear children. I myself, I gave uh, birth to 13 children. And I know several cases of women that had 18, 21. I know one woman that gave birth to 22 uh, single births. You can be worn out, but oh no, they get up and they praise you in church and tell how wonderful this woman is and how she's doing her duty and we should all follow her example. But we were just breeding stock, that's all. It occurs to me in just watching Cody Brown, he drives a nice sports car. It doesn't even have room for a baby seat and yet his wives drive minivans so they can carry all the kids and all the groceries and that in itself speaks of a very different lifestyle that he lives and enjoys compared to his wives. That men, when they come home, they want it quiet. My husband would come home, he want, uh, the kids would be up waiting to see him because we haven't seen him for days, sometimes weeks. It wasn't our turn yet. They would be ready for bed and want to see him and he wanted them uh, to go to bed, get out of the way. Uh, they want quiet, they want peace, uh, they're overwhelmed with all these wives and children. Don't, uh, they really are, they are overwhelmed with them. And therefore they just try to uh, be on their own. I can see why Cody has this car, he's uh, going to get in and drive off where he can have a sense of peace and quiet and not be bugged by his wives. Joe Darger wrote a book called Love Times Three. And in his book he states that his wives were responsible for their own emotional and financial needs. How does that work? Well, I just talked to a woman the other day that emailed me and she told me that her father had 13 wives and lived in Salt Lake City and she's my age. And she said that of the 13 wives, he never supported one of them. And her own mother gave birth to 13 children and she was out cleaning houses and doing anything, scrounging here and there, uh, trying to get enough food just to take care of her children. The men will let you know, a big part of them, that you are not their responsibility. And that's why so many of these women, out of necessity, uh, and because their children are starving to death, go get on welfare and they, are counted as single mothers. And the government, you are paying for most of these women. Your taxes are taking care of these polygamous women and children. Andrea Emmett Moore wrote a book titled God's Brothel. She worked in the system investigating and counseling children, little girls specifically, that came out of polygamous families. And Andrea said that the children were raised on welfare deliberately, that it was not a mistake, that the falsified birth certificates were always the earmark of children born to be raised by the system on government funds and not to tie the responsibility to the father. Have you ever heard of that? Well, I've heard people say that they did not falsify birth certificates. But I'm a witness that that is a lie. My <laughs> own father uh, had a birth certificate made up for me, and his name, instead of being uh, Morris Coons, was Maurice Kuntz, K-O-O-N-T-Z. And I grew up with a different birth certificate because he did not want the world to know that I was his child because he was afraid that he might go to prison. Well, the interesting thing is today, Cody Brown is suing for his religious rights, as he names it, but literally suing the state's government because he doesn't want to be prosecuted for polygamy, which is illegal. Only in America can you sue your country for disobeying its laws. <laughs> but the irony is, Cody does not want to legalize polygamy. He wants to decriminalize it. And Ann Wilder, who is a strong advocate for polygamy, also wants to back Cody in decriminalizing it, but she does not want to legalize it because legalizing it would 
make the fathers responsible for the children they spawn, and they don't want that. If they decriminalize it, then they can just go on accepting the government funds and creating a way of life on government funds that they that most of them do today. There's a few exceptions to the rule, but comparatively very few. Do you know anything about how they handle their financial operation? Most of the cults, uh, the, they support the leaders right off, and the leaders live better than anybody else. Uh, if you're a, one of the prophet's wives, you live on a higher level than anybody else, and you are honored in one thing or another because you're you know, uh, married to one of the brethren. But the people themselves live very poor. A lot of them even get food stamps and they t take their food stamps and stuff and buy it for the prophet's wives. And you know, when I grew up, we were told that uh, it was like wearing a badge. He who suffers the most, the most uh, gets the greatest reward and suffering was a part of life. And so uh, people kind of wore it like a badge, you know, I'm suffering and therefore I'm humble and I'm righteous and I'm good, you know. So you save up suffering like brown stamps for rewards in heaven because you're not getting any here? Exactly, exactly. And all of this is under the commandment of God that you dare not disobey? Yeah, well, another thing, a woman doesn't dare disobey because if she uh, complains or tells her husband that she doesn't like this or that she's being mistreated by another wife, it's all her fault. It's all her fault and she better just shape up and do something or she's not going to have her reward. So if you don't if you're afraid to, or if you do speak up, he, he may not give you your nights. And if he's got ten wives, that's kind of a long time to go and without coming back around to you. And by the time you get back, you've still not settled the fight you had last time, so it doesn't work out very good. <laughs> I've been told by some polygamous women that their husband has literally placed them on a shelf for years. Literally years. Because he was disgruntled about something they did or didn't do or could or couldn't do. Yeah, I've heard it. They say, I put her out to pasture. They say, I put her out to pasture. And uh, a woman, I'll tell you one thing, a woman's needs are not fulfilled. She is not satisfied sexually uh, in, uh, or economically any other way. She is there to just uh, bear children, to have one baby after another, to, uh, you know, the, the men kind of, it's like wearing a notch on your belt and they can put a little mark on it every time every child and every wife they have. I've heard men sit around and brag about how many wives they have and how they've got this girl and that girl that uh, they're courting and might come into their families. They, they just brag about it and it's more of a, a brag thing I think almost than religion. <laughs> I'd like to know how it would even be possible, possible, for a man to meet the emotional needs of all of those women. How could he do it? Just his women, let alone his children, how could he do that? They were never met. They were never met. Uh, like when he had nine other wives, he'd come over and tell you good night, and he might be there five minutes, just walk in and say, hey, I came to tell you good night, and kiss you and say, is everything okay? And you're following out the door trying to get a little bit of attention or want to walk into the corner so that you can spend two or three more minutes with him. But uh, the men could never uh, fulfill uh, the women, and they really didn't try. We were told, hey, it's your obligation to keep yourself happy. You're in this, and you just turn to God and let God keep you happy. How about the children? Do they really grow up having any kind of a relationship with a father? No, not really. How can they? If you've got 29 sons and 29 daughters, where do you find time for a relationship? You don't hardly have time for even have a relationship with the wives, let alone with the children. And that's one thing that is kind of been to an advantage, I think, for this next generation, because I've known children that have 50, 60, 70 brothers and sisters, and uh, they don't want polygamy. They have not had fathers. They have not had time with their father. They haven't had him caring for them. And they, he don't go, doesn't ever go to any ball games or anything. He's never in their life and they've grown up with a sense of bitterness saying, hey, I don't want this. I it didn't get, to, I wasn't valued when I was a child and I will not put up with polygamy. So before when everybody was a polygamist, there's very, very few people in the LeBaron colony now that are even living polygamy because people are tired of it. Mark Shirtloff, the Attorney General of Utah, has openly stated that he will not prosecute polygamy. 
because it's a basic tenet of their religion. In this conversation, you have informed me that blood atonement is a basic tenet of their religion. Is sending their children off to work to support themselves and having child brides a basic tenet of their religion? Is not educating their children and not providing medical attention when their wives are giving birth when it's necessary a basic tenet of their religion? Where does the basic tenet of religion begin and the human rights start? Well, as far as I'm concerned, it's child abuse, it's uh, wife abuse, it's abuse emotionally, it's abuse, 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 abuse. And that is the reason that I ended up writing my book, uh, Shattered Dreams, um, even though it was very hard for me to come out and do it and I was criticized and uh, branded a traitor because I had gone against my people, the polygamists, uh, to write this book. But I will no longer stand by and allow women and children to be abused underneath the cloak of religion. The time has come that we have got to fight for ourselves and fight for our lives. And the reason why I say fight for our lives is because we're overshadowed with this blood atonement. And not only that, we have no life if we are just obeying somebody else. We become zombies and we're just uh, fulfilling their lives. And I have seen so many women that have had nervous breakdowns, uh, depression, I used to live in depression all the time and I thought it was the norm. And we can only have joy when we become empowered. And the only way we will ever become empowered is when we stand up and say, I love myself enough that I will not uh, allow anybody to abuse me in any way. And, and it's got to come to that. Your book, Shattered Dreams, was a New York Times bestseller. And then you followed that up with another book called Cult Insanity, in which you literally laid out all of the murderous behavior of Earl LeBaron from an inside story, your own. In that, from what you're saying today, it seems like Earl LeBaron followed his religion to the hilt and that he was, according to the doctrines, following his religion because his religion gave him the right to kill people that did not believe the way he believed. Is that true? Well, absolutely, 100%. That We were taught also that we should follow the, the laws of the land, you know, you should keep the laws of the land. And yet, they say, well, God's laws supersede the, the laws of the land, and so polygamy is God's law. In other words, it gives you <laughs> A reason to break any law you want as long as you say that God's behind it. In other words, if you can justify it through your religion, you can lie? Exactly. You can In fact, we were told to lie. I was told to tell people that my own father was my uncle. Say, don't you tell them that I'm your father. Well, technically, he was my uncle because he was married to my mother's sister. But I wanted him to be my dad. I felt that it was just a put down, it was a, a form of rejection, but I couldn't even tell people who he was. Robin, Cody Brown's wife number four, states that she was born in polygamy and her father could not claim her because of the way people treat polygamists and what they say. Actually, if he claimed her, he would have been responsible as a father, legally responsible for all of the children born to her mother. 